quick wrap up of all the things that I read for the adventures through Wonderland. So the readathon is now, today is October 4th, it is now officially wrapped up. It was for the whole month of September and now I'm jumping into a couple other readathons for October. So really excited about those. Anyways, I just want to do a quick wrap up of what I read for the adventures through Wonderland. So what I started with was Howl's Moving Castle, which was one of the books that A Touch of Whimsy had done, one of their first books that they did for their book club. And I bought it but was unable to get to it. So at that time, it was like June or July, so I wasn't able to get to it then, but I got to it this time and I really enjoyed it. If you don't know what it's about, I have watched the movie. It's a Studio Ghibli movie and the movie and the book are quite different. It is about Howl and his moving castle and how it moves with a demon that is trapped inside the fire. He's a demon that is trapped as like a ball of fire in the fireplace. And Howl is a wizard and his castle moves around but there's like inside the castle there is a doorknob thing that has like four different colors and depending where you switch it is where the door opens up to. And Sophie is a hat maker. She's got a couple of sisters. Her dad dies or her mom dies when they're little and then her dad remarries and has a couple of daughters with his new wife and then he passes away and then the daughters go to work and be apprenticed at one as a baker, one as a witch. And then Sophie stays with the family business running a hat shop and she gets cursed by the wicked witch of the waste. She gets cursed to be like an old woman so she goes from like 18 to like 98 <laughs> kind of thing. And it's just her journey of leaving the hat shop and going to find out who she is and what her purpose is and this whole journey and ends up coming upon Howell's moving castle and she believes that Howell is uh, like a wicked wizard that lures in young women like what she was at the beginning of the book and pretty much like eats their hearts. That's what powers the castle. She quickly learns what actually powers the castle and that Howell may not be as wicked as he seems. I really enjoyed this book. It was very whimsical. It was very magical. Howell is very dramatic and there's some funny parts with that and just the way that Sophie handles him and is just... Sophie really embraces her role as an older woman and how she takes care of Howell and Michael, I believe his name is, who is like the... his... is Howell's apprentice. But this was really fun and really different than the movie and I enjoyed it. And then for a cozy night in, I also picked up The Borrowers and we also watched both movies, the live action with John Goodman in it and the animated, also Studio Ghibli, The Secret Life of Airy Eddie. So borrowers are tiny people that live in your home and it kind of is an explanation for, you know, how you're always missing something like bobby pins go missing or sewing needle or just little tiny things in your home that are kind of like not important but it's frustrating paper clips pens all these little things that just go missing and you're like why why do these things always go missing the borrowers is kind of like mary norton's answer to what where those things go and how they go missing and it's really sweet this was my cozy night in i think i spent like three nights reading it but i read it all in one place if you're looking for the movie that is closest to the this book it would be the Secret Life of Ariadne is much closer to this book than the live action borrowers, which I had seen as a child myself. It's just really fun. There is a boy staying with his aunt because he is sick, so he's gone to the country to try and get better. And he sees the father in this, and then he ends up meeting Ariadne as well, and it's kind of their relationship and how he ends up borrowing more things and bigger things for them. And it was really fun and I would definitely recommend it and watching the movies with the kids especially. They really liked, they prefer the Ariadne one which we have seen before. The Borrowers, the live action one, it was still fun but I feel, I don't know, it wasn't as whimsical, it wasn't as entertaining. The kids were like, well see you later, we're gonna go play. But they also did that with Ariadne but again they've seen that one before. But this was my cozy night in. I also picked up two books that I knew I would enjoy because I read them out of out of four. I picked up the first two from the Sunwing series or Silverwing and Sunwing by Kenneth Opal. 
I didn't remember a lot about what they were about besides being about a bat shade and kind of like his adventures and stuff but I didn't remember a lot of it going into the movie or into the books. This is Shade's first winter in their nesting tree. It is just the females and the newborns there. So they are moving on to another tree where they will meet up with the males of the colony and then they go on from there to hibernaculum where they will basically gorge themselves and hibernate for the winter. And we learned there is a lot of like mythology to this and we learn a lot about the world of the bats and the bats um, fly at nighttime. The bats cannot see the daylight so as soon as like right at dusk or at dawn when the sun is about to rise they must be back into their nest so they have to be back before the sun rises but Shade decides that he wants to he's the runt he was born early. He's tinier than all the other bats. There's another bat there that is kind of cocky. He's big and he's powerful out of all the newborns. He's like the jock and Shade kind of wants to be like, oh, he's just the dumb jock and I'm, I'm better. I'm smarter and braver. So he decides he's going to go see the sun. He flies out to an area where he can see the sun rising and the jock follows him. And then Chinook gets scared and decides to fly back and tells Shade's mom that he has gone to go see the sunrise. So Shade's mom comes and kind of saves him from this owl because the owls can fly like during the day, like sunset, sunrise kind of they're out. The bats have the night sky, the owls and the birds have like the day. And so this owl decides that he has broken the law. His mom kind of like rescue, rescues him and they fly Back to Tree Haven, where the, the colony is right now. The owl wants Shade's life, basically, because he broke the law. So if they, if they hand over Shade, then the owls will leave the bats alone and nothing will come from it. But the elders decide that they do not, that they are not going to give up Shade. And the owls come back that night with sticks on fire and they burn down Tree Haven. That's been there for like hundreds of years. So the bats are forced out of their home and there's now like this war that's going to start between the bats and the owls. There was already tensions between the bats and the owls because there had been a war like 15 years prior between the beasts and the birds and the owls did not or the the bats did not take a side. They did not fight for the beasts and they did not fight for the birds so they are kind of like the outcasts and everyone's mad at them because they didn't take a side. So now this has been an excuse for the owls to take steps forward to cause war between the bat with the bats. So Shade, the tiny little runt, just starts all this trouble. And then as they are flying from where they were in Tree Haven to finally get to Hibernaculum, there's a storm. He gets swept over the ocean. He ends up, I think he's on a sailboat or not a sailboat, but on a boat for a little bit. And then he ends up on this island and he meets another bat that is... Uh, like a bright wing bat so she's got like more of a reddish fur color and wings where he's all black. She, Marina, has been exiled from her colony because she has a band on her forearm which some of the bats in Shade's colony also have bands on their forearms. They're from the humans. They don't know what it means. If it's good, is it bad? Uh, Shade's father disappeared the winter or that spring before Shade was born his father disappeared and he had a band on his forearm as well. And so that is also part of the mystery. And what are the humans doing? Are they part of uh, Nocturna's promise? And so there is a lot happening in this middle grade book. There is religion, war, like all this stuff. And Nocturna is like the ruler of the above world the ruler of the night and Nocturna's promise is supposed to be about allowing the bats to take back the day and be able to again fly and see the sun without any repercussions of it and then there is also uh, that she doesn't know about but then they meet this cannibalistic bat from the jungle he is like a priest kind of he believes in Zots which is supposed to be, he believes, a more powerful god of the bats. And he is the god of the underworld. And he is trying to get power. 
which we learn more about in the second book that I read, Sunwing. There's going to be an eclipse of the sun, and in that, like, two minutes that the sun is completely eclipsed, they need to sacrifice the hearts of a hundred animals. So, moving from this to this, trigger warning in this for, like, animal sacrifice from another animal the bat that is doing like the cannibalistic bat from uh his name is goth from the jungle like there is another bat on the altar and he like sinks his jaws in and rips the heart out and like eats it and he's like this is for you zots this is my my sacrifice and stuff like that so that's kind of like that's intense and they're going to do this times like a hundred so in this, Shade and Marina meet up and they manage to get back to Shade's family. But they believe that there is something with the humans and this ring on their forearms. And so they're going, they've met up with a few different bats along the way that talk about this human building. So they want to go and see if Shade believes his dad is still alive if they can find them. So this starts with them finding that human building, getting trapped, realize that the humans are using them as weapons and they are actually tying discs to the bat's bodies and releasing them and there is some kind of like homing thing that's like sending out kind of like an echolocation and it's calling the bats in and the bats fly to it and burst into flames and so they are using them as like fire bombs. Owls and bats. So that's pretty intense, the humans. they So they are questioning, like, okay, this is part of Nocturna's promise. We trust Nocturna. But now the humans are sending us to our death. Is this, is Nocturna even real or not? So Shade is really struggling with his religion and his beliefs and everything he's believed his whole, like, one year of life. And trying to find his dad and, like, all this stuff. And it's really quite high adventure. Like Silverwing says, uh, I... I can't put it down adventure and Sunwing. I stayed up all night reading Sunwing. Hang on tight. The suspense is incredible. And it really is quite suspenseful for a children's book. So I really enjoyed these and I have two more, but I knew I couldn't get to them in the month of September, Firewing and Darkwing. So I am hoping to get to those in November after all my Halloween reads that I have to do. I also picked up the Train to Impossible Places, which was the group book that we could read if we wanted. It's so beautiful. I love the illustrations. love the colors and everything. Inside there are a few drawings, but they are all in black and white. There's a couple big drawings. So I liked those little details. It was a lot of reading. Like, it's not highly illustrated. I really enjoyed this book. I think I'd give it a 4 out of 5, probably. Maybe 5 out of 5. I don't know. I've read a lot. I don't... It was good and it was fun and I did not get to finish it with my daughter, unfortunately. It does say ages 10 to 14, like I said, and my daughter's not even quite nine yet. So it was a lot of reading for her, but I, I own it. So now it's on the bookshelf for her to read if she's interested in it. But we did read and I forgot to grab it. Over two days we read, mostly all in one sitting actually, but Tea Dragon Society. So we really liked that one. And that was really fun and the drawings and everything were so beautiful in that. I love the colors and the art style of that. And it was a really quick and easy read to get through as well. The Train to Impossible Places. There is this girl, Susie. She, I like her. She's very, like, she's 12. She's very practical. She likes, like in the beginning of the book, she's doing her physics homework. So she likes things to be in order. She likes that, you know, A plus B equals C. She likes the predictability of science and physics. So this train ends up in her house. Her parents are put under like a sleeping spell, but they miss Susie. The people that were in charge of doing the sleeping spells, they miss that Susie is there. So she catches these trolls in her house and they've like stretched the house like super big so that the train can fit. But from the outside, it looks the same kind of idea. So... First of all, that is kind of like messing with her because she's like, this is not how this works. This is not how this is supposed to be. This is, uh, this, this isn't working for physics. Anyways, they decide that they're, because she was not put under the sleeping spell and she caught them in her living room, they are going to scramble her brain after the train leaves. 
and she's like, no, I don't want you to scramble my brain. I don't want to forget this. This is amazing. And she jumps on the train and takes off. And this whole adventure ensues. She travels under the ocean. She travels under a troll bridge. The trolls, there's like above the bridge where all their like the postal services and any like government stuff is. But then under the bridge, they live, the trolls live in their homes and everything like that's the residential area but it's upside down so that was really fun to read about and she travels to the moon at one point and she meets um pirates that are on that are have died she meets the ghosts of pirates under the ocean and all these things and it was really fun and i really liked because most times you read books like this and the kids are just Kids have these wild imaginations and they'll believe pretty much anything you tell them. And they're just up for anything. But Susie, she's 12 and like I said, she's a scientist. She likes physics. So she's like, this is not the way it should be. This is not how this should work. So I liked that she was a little bit skeptical, but then like jumped in and did things anyways and kind of just learned to roll with it and she enjoyed it. So I really highly recommend this as as well of course it was it was beautiful it was fun um i know there are more books to come like the great brain robbery and then last but not least i picked up sophie anderson's the house with chicken legs and i picked this up for the three blondes and a book book club because kaylin is a part of that book club as well as the touch of whimsy that was doing this readathon so i thought this was perfect and this was my strange and weird book to read and it was strange and weird and fun and I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. And this house has chicken legs. There's more than one house in the world with chicken legs. It is a Yaga's house and they are guides for the dead. So the house will move whenever it feels necessary. One day you can be on the ocean, the next day you could be in the desert, and the next day you could be in the Arctic. Sophie, it is her job, not Sophie the author's name her name is marinka i believe is how you say it and she lost her parents died and she's living with her grandma her grandma is the yaga baba yaga she doesn't like it she doesn't want to be a yaga marinka she wants to go and live with the living she wants to go and see what it's like to just live a normal life but she can't because her grandma is constantly telling her never leave this, like, the fence around the house. What is really cool about this house is that it doesn't just have chicken legs and run. It has, like, its own personality. It took care of her growing up. Her parents died when she was a baby. And so her grandma and this house has been taking care of her ever since. It plays, like, hide and seek with her. It plays tag with her. It can, like, pick her up in its legs like in its claws and like put it on her on the roof. It's size, it just, it has its own personality. If you look at like the front with the windows, those are like its eyes, right? And it's really expressive. And she's 12 in the book now. And she's kind of just gotten to this place where it's not fun to be trapped in this house anymore. She doesn't want to play tag with the house anymore. She's just kind of outgrowing this thing, these things, and she wants to move on go and be with the living and see what it's like but as she tries that and tries breaking out and doing a little bit more she realizes that it's not always what it seems to be around the living and to have friends and stuff like that and that some people can be really cruel and really mean and you have to be careful with the friends that you are making yeah she learns a lot of hard lessons along the way and her grandma also has to go and guide one of the spirits does not go through the door then that night that it's that she is supposed to and Marinka hides her in her room and tries to keep her as a friend and then when her grandmother finds out they um, do the ceremony to help guide her and her grandma says she's too weak to go on her own and I will have to guide her and she goes through the the gate where the dead spirits pass through leaving Marinka on her own and it's her journey of trying to discover who she is and also get her grandmother back because she doesn't want to be left responsible guiding the dead spirits she wants her grandma to do it so that she can live her own life it was really good and i really enjoyed this and i wasn't sure what to think about it but yeah it was good and i would give it like a at least a four out of five 
And like I said, I also read the Tea Dragon Society, and that was really fun. And we had a little dragon tea party, me and my daughter, and that was good. So, yeah, anyways, thank you for watching. I had so much fun doing these adventures through Wonderland. And let me know if you participated, uh, if you read any middle grade books, what are your favorite middle grades? Have you read any of these books? Did you like them or not? What are your thoughts? Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Be sure to hit subscribe and like and all those good things. Bye!